people um, see more everyday people who've done extraordinary things and can be inspired by that. So I suddenly thought, I really do think this is a wonderful challenge to take an unknown heroine and, and tell her story. And it's important because I think people tend to think history is dry and just facts and figures. And no, it's all made up of people who, who follow dreams, who, who fight adversity to, to, you know, achieve their dreams. So I, I really got very interested in the project. So the next challenge really was, okay, how, how do I find who I'm going to do? Well, the Regency, there are not a lot of interesting women simply because the, the, the social rules and regulations for women allowed so few of them any freedom of choice. If you were an aristocrat, which Lady Hester was, she um, she immediately came to mind. I knew her story from um, her later life. She left um, Britain never to return uh, when she was in her early 30s. She went to the Middle East, um, decided to throw all the rules to the wind. Uh, she dressed in men's clothing. She rode astride. She raised her own private army. She brokered deals with the warlords. She was in a position of power um, and was called Queen of the Desert. Mm -hmm. Now, she became very eccentric in her later life. She got into mysticism and you know, cult and psychedelic drugs. Um, and I thought, I just wasn't sure how it would spin a story around the later part of her life. But I, I found a scholarly biography on her and uh, started reading about her early life and her, um, her, I'll get to why her family is so important in her story. But um, I, I suddenly saw this was kind of a coming of age story. And I found, um, some a very good starting point and an end point that gave me an arc for a story, I thought. So, okay, now I have my character, I think. And how do I now begin fleshing that out? Um, the first thing I'm going to sort of explain is she she was born into an incredibly illustrious family. Um, it's it's a, a, a bunch of raffish adventurers, swashbuckling war heroes, brilliant politicians. Her uncle and her grandfather are two of the most famous um, prime ministers in Britain's history. Um, her father was um, a famous scientist, totally eccentric. He raised his children. He believed in Rousseau's, um, you know, society and um, corrupts the human spirit, so he he wouldn't let them socialize with their their neighbors, or he, they had a very eccentric upbringing. But she, you know, you realize I was reading more about her. She was sort of born to, um, you know, to be a legend herself. She's among these incredibly talented men, and um, she she is um, she's. A beauty. She is um, very bright, intelligent. Um, she is a, a sharp wit, and she does not um, hold her tongue. She feels she <laughs> has the right to express her her views. So she is totally unconventional, um, and, and gets away with it pretty much because of her her family. Um, so. Um, that they've really um, formed, she's in this milieu where people are, are achievers. And her great great grandfather is known as Diamond Pit, his, which is plays into the cover. He, he went to the West Indies, I mean, India, the East India Company, and became, um, a, a, he had his own merchant company. He was so successful, they bribed him to come work for them. And he, by hook or by crook, we don't know quite how he obtained this diamond, but he brought it back to England, probably by hook. It is now probably the second most famous diamond in the world. In the world. It's in the Louvre, 
but he became fabulously wealthy and founded this whole intermix of three prominent families, the Stanhopes, the Pitts, and the Grenkers, who all intermarried. And um, the, the diamond went on to, he sold it to the Regent of France, it became Marie Antoinette's diamond. She wore it all the time in her favorite velvet hat. It then fell into Napoleon's hands and he put it in his coronation crown. So it is it just this magical, it, there's something about the diamond you think that sort of touched the family. They all have this sort of brilliance about them. Um, so getting back to Hester, I now have um, her, um, how do I do more research? I pick my character. Well, because she was from a prominent family, um, a lot of her letters have been saved. In fact, her niece put together a compendium of the letters and actually did annotations to her memories. of uh, Hester also later in life dictated a, a memoir to her personal physician. Now, both of them, I think Hester was all editing her life, how she wanted to appear, and he had his own axe to grind. Most people say it's not a, a, a reliable narrative, but it's interesting to read nonetheless. So I was very lucky in that I was able to read her words and, and letters and get a real feel for her. And when I first started the project, I wasn't sure I was going to like her very. She, you know, has the reputation of being very acerbic, and and um, does not suffer fools gladly. But I really came to appreciate her 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 wonderful um, pithy wit, her her sense of humor, and actually her kindness and her loyalty to her friends and her family. She was very. You know, she has this reputation of being very sharp, and yet when you see her actions and how how loyal she was to her family, her younger brothers particularly, and her her uncle William Pitt the younger, um, it's it's she's really quite um, quite an interesting person. She has a lot of different layers. So now I get to know her a little bit better and I see the time period I'm going to do. She comes to London at age 24, 1799, her first introduction to society. And in 1810, she leaves Britain forever. So that seemed to me her her coming of age story and, and how she was shaped by her time in, in London. So um, and how I went about doing that really was um, through the men in her life, because she comes to London, she knows nothing about society, she meets Beau Brummel, who is this uh, legendary character and the, the arbiter of style, he's known for his dress and his wit too. He, he, they become friends, I think they sense their sort of kindred souls, they, they are... Um, um, fairly sardonic personalities. And I think he teaches her, he gives her the first veneer of sophistication that, that high society has layers within layers and you, you have to have different faces. You have to know all the um, machinations that are going on. And I think she begins to get a little sophistication. She also loves the freedom. She loves the color, the, the excitement, the balls, all of this is stimulating and she just wants to be part of it. And, 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 um, unlike other conventional aristocratic women, she's in no hurry to marry. She has come to London later than most debutantes would. And the, her family didn't press. They're wealthy. They don't need to make alliances. So she's given um, freedom to, to, um, to sort of... Um, enjoy herself there. And she meets her second cousin uh, during this time, who is um, was a naval officer. He ran away to sea as a young boy. Um, he fought with his father. And then at 16, inherits a title. He's now a lord. He comes back. He's um, fascinating and, and um, can be charming. He's also a volatile temper. He, he 
a, a the cartoonists in in London have a field day with him, the satirical cartoonist. He he attacked his former commanding officer with a cane and caned him in the middle of the street. He has duels. He's he's just very hot tempered. He he appeals to um, Hester's rebellious side. They become very enamored with each other and the history books show that they did have an affair um which for a woman was very no-no um but um they get away with it uh people aren't watching that carefully she spends time at her grandmother's estate and they sort of slip away but rumors begin to get back to pit her uncle who um politically cannot afford the the uh scandal so he he um gives her an ultimatum he said you either have to go home and live with your father um which wasn't they they were now not speaking to each other at all that would have been very difficult or he had Pitt had just resigned as prime minister because he um disagreed with king uh, george the third about um whether Catholics should be allowed to vote. And Pitt was very, really um, believed they should, so he resigned in protest. He had another position um, called um, Lord Warden of the St. Courts, which meant he was the, the, would be in charge of protecting the coast of England, that the southern, southwest coast. Um, because they really thought France was when Napoleon was going to invade. And he has this wonderful, his residence is called Walner Castle. So he says to Hester, you can come be my personal um, assistant there, um, but you have to break it off with Hamilton. Well, she, the idea that she can be with in politics and help him um, with, with organizing the military, really appealed to her. And, um, and Calford, uh, her cousin, um, conveniently gets himself killed in a duel. So it makes things very easy for her. Um, so off they go um, to Walmer Castle. And um, this is a whole new world for her. She loves it. She is really important. She rides out with Pitt. She is a fabulous horsewoman. And the local militia goes crazy. They call her the Amazon. They cheer her whenever she shows up. She wears a scarlet jacket and, and black boots. And Pitt is not a very outdoorsy guy. He's very um, uh, uh, awkward on his horse. And she sort of saves the day. They, you know, they just love her, the troops. She also makes friends with a dashing general named Sir, uh, John, General John Moore, who is Pitt's friend, and he's organizing the defensive. So they begin to ride together. They're, they're good friends. But Pitt is plotting his return as, as prime minister, as Moore is leaving. And um, she, politicians are coming down to Walmer. She is serving as his hostess. She is the Oh, she's a woman at the table with them every night at dinner and drinking port, and she is in her element. This is the life she wants to lead. She wants to be equal with the man. And um, it's at this point she meets her second male in her life, um, who is um, the a very up and coming diplomat, the exact opposite of her cousin, charming, smooth. He's renowned as the most beautiful man in England. Um, and he was very handsome and polished. And she suddenly sees this would be the perfect life for her. She is she married a diplomat. She loves politics. She would be his confidant, his advisor. Um, and for a time, um, his name is uh, Grant, Granville Levison Gower, uh, and known as Granville, everyone calls him Granville. And he seems to reciprocate her, her, um, her um, attraction, and they um, they initiate the book, too. So she is now with this man, and she's dropping hints that they are probably going to get married. 
well, little does she know he's having a long term affair with another a married aristocrat, and he has no intention of marrying a, 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 an older, wiser woman. He would his family would demand that he marry someone right out of the studio who would be very um, complacent. And um, Pitt suddenly realizes what's going on and. Um, immediately sends him off to Russia as the Russian ambassador to make sure this doesn't develop and do stand alone. Hester is heartbroken. I mean, she is just um, devastated and um, tries to take her own life and who um, And it's, um, one of the, one of the um, um, things that I find so interesting about her life and one of the reasons I was attracted to her story really is um her she's an amazing story of triumphs and tragedies you can see just from that where she's at the top of no woman was ever you know she was um residing at uh, 10 Downing Street and was this personal confidant they every politician had to go to her and um ask her advice and then she has personal devastation there. Um and yet she rises Phoenix like, you know, from the ashes and keeps her belief in herself and and her dreams. It's just it's really a remarkable um, story, one of the reasons to look back at me. And I'm going to take a little break here because I want to talk about, you know, I've talked about the facts and how you write but I have an example of how fact and fiction, my idea of, of creating the story. So let me just get my computer on lock. Um, I'm going to show you. Hester was very, um, if you can see, I can. Bring this closer. This is Hester. She, there are only two portraits known of her. She, she absolutely refused to have her picture done, but she's um, quite a, a striking woman. She's nearly six feet tall. So again, she she was very um, very. Uh, and was that tall for the time? Yes. I mean, it's tall now, but. But it's, yeah, I mean, women were really yeah. closer to five feet. I wow. Know. She was very, very striking, noticeable. Um, and this is another one. Well, I can stay here. Right? Um, <laughs> yeah. And um, the only other picture that's known of her. And this is her later life when she was in the Middle East and um, smoking her tea um, and um, that's wow and, uh, from from her, um, and I just wanted to show. I think it's fun to see some of this is um, Pitt the Elder, her grandfather, and that was her uncle, her beloved uncle that she was. Um, and now we get to, and that's her swashbuckling um, cousin, Sir Sidney Smith. And that is another cousin who is a prime minister. He's a grand, a grand um, part of the family. So quite an amazing. That her father. That was satirical cartoons they were making. He he renounced his title and declared that he was citizen Stanhope because he supported the French Revolution. He was quite a character. Um, and this was um, a satirical cartoon of her her cousin. Camelford beating his, um, his commanding officer, um, and this is this is now going to be part of the little scene I'm going to show. This is Princess Carolyn, um, the Prince Regent's wife, who was having an affair with her cousin Sir Sidney, um, and this is Granville, um, and this is in the British Art Center. They own this this. Wonderful! It's like six feet tall. It's like a life size, and um, and then this is Sir John. Who, who, I have to admit, I have a little thing for, <laughs> but um, so 
this painting of Moore, the painting of Grenville, and the painting of of uh, Princess Carolyn are all done by Sir Thomas Lawrence, who is one of the preeminent portraiture portrait painters. He is renowned for how well he sees um, into his his um, subjects, um, and they were all painted right around the time Hester was in London. So I decided to set the scene in his studio where. Princess Carolyn has met her, and this is fact, through at, at a house party her cousin was giving. And she um, is always bored having to sit for a court. And she says, come entertain me. You'll talk to me while I'm, um, while I'm having my portrait done by Lawrence. And so I have during a break, while she's resting from her clothes, that um, Hester knows that, that Lawrence is painting um, Granville, the, the, the diplomat, and ask if she can see it, the work in progress. And they go and they, um, she said, I think you make him look a little too smug. And he, and I have Lauren say, oh, well, I, you would probably know better than me. But he has this look on his face that she can tell he, he doesn't think he's misjudged who the guy really is. <laughs> and, um, she thinks about it, and then as they're walking back, she notices the little, the, the smaller um, portrait of, of Moore, and she recognizes it, of course, because he's her friend. And they begin talking about, um, you've made him have a very nice smile, and he he actually had scar, he, he was a wounded war hero, really. And he said, well, you know, our public wants to see their heroes perfectly. So yes, I take artistic license. And Moore was very angry at me for doing that. He he was such a modest man. He he really didn't didn't want to to be made to look like he didn't think of himself as a hero. Um, so in in those in the in the scene, I took the portraits that actually exist and tried to imagine what might have happened in that. And that's sort of the fun of what I tried to do in the book, is taking the many facts um, and trying to imagine um, some of the, give give a, 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 a write like a novel in a mm -hmm. sense. How do I make, how do I make a reader care about Hester's challenges and her, and her, um, how she deals with them? In, in terms of taking the facts of her life and turning it into a story that would be compelling. Um, that's what I was always constantly working with on um, as, as I wrote this and, and decided to do it in first person because I felt it, she's such a strong character, you really have to, um, it required that sort of, um, I think intensity, at least I felt trying to say it in third person what she's thinking, what she's feeling, came out um, better on that. So now we have another turning point in her life. Um, she is she recovers from um, from the overdose. Kit is very concerned both about her. I mean, they're very very close. Um, uh, but he's also concerned about his career. I mean, it, it, it's more time. He just cannot afford a scandal. So he sends it back to London. He says, you, you have to be out of London. No one, they've hidden the fact that she she took an overdose, it, just that she's been ill. Um, so she goes to Walmer Castle and again, sort of reinvents herself. She becomes very interested in gardening, which is a wonderful sort of metaphor for re-blossoming and um, coming back to life. And she she knows Pitt um, health is getting worse. And he, he likes to walk outside and it's a very barren, they're right on the coast. So she designs a garden. She, she studies garden design. She, um, she talks to the gardener there, and they have this plan to plant trees to make a sanctuary for him. That he, um, and he finds an old abandoned chalk 
uh, a mine right on the property and decides how she's going to do it. Well, she then drafts the local military and to, to do all the planting. They bring in trees. I mean, she orders them from, from arboreums and um, she makes this wonderful um, garden for her. So, it, and it's still, it's still there today. It's one wow. of the tourist sites. It's called Lady. They have a big thing on their website saying Lady, Lady Hester's Gardens. So mm -hmm. she she was extraordinary. Um, and um, a year or two later, Pitt dies in office. He, he was a very young age. He probably drank himself to death. So now she's on her own. She really would. Her family, the the Grendel side of her family, she's been so unconventional. They won't have anything to do with her. Her father won't speak with her, and but Pitt has arranged for her to have a stipend uh, um, from the king. Um, uh, so she finally actually has some money of her own, and she establishes her own household. She sort of takes her two half brothers, who she has gotten army commissions for, um, um, into um, uh, under her wing, and they she makes the house for them. They come and visit, and um, when they have leave, and um, she then reconnects with General Moore because he comes back from war on the continent, and the government is thinking of sending him to. Spain to to help the troops. He totally disagrees with their strategy. He thinks it's going to be a disaster, and she helps him navigate because she knows all these men, and she was able she's able to get an entree. Um, the government still won't listen. He's a good soldier. He goes off to do his duty. Um, Historians disagree on whether they had a secret agreement to be married when he came back from, from the war. Um, but I've read their personal letters and I'm a romantic at heart. So I, I really, I like to think that um, they really were so nice. And, um, um, things did not go well over there. I won't get too specific about um, um so we come to 1810, and um, her, her younger brother is very badly wounded in, in battle, and um, her older brother is the, 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 the oldest of the, the younger two brothers, is killed in the same battle. And he, the younger one comes back with basically PTS, and she says, we are taking you off. To the Greek islands, we're going to where it's sun, and where you can we can both forget about some of the pain that we've suffered here in England. And he goes, um, he he does heal. He returns to his regiment in Gibraltar. She never comes back to England. It mm -hmm. is she goes on to a new chapter, a new life. But um, um, as as I said, you know. So I bookended, and I think in some ways it, it's a redemptive story. It is a story of somebody whose courage and conviction sees them through the adversities in life. She refused to give in to the adversities. And um, I think, I, I just think, I found it a, a, a fascinating and a very uplifting project to work on, to bring these stories to life and you know, I read a biography of Pitt the Younger uh, by a, a, a very renowned historian. It's considered one of the better biographies. There's not one, there's one mention um, on, you know, when Pitt is dying and they won't, the doctor won't let Hester in to say goodbye. The only mention of Lady Hester in the book. Mm -hmm. And you're thinking, these are the narratives that are being written. There is this extraordinary woman who, for a time, had a place in the seat of power at a very critical time in British history, and she is has no has no mention. These are the stories that I think are fun to bring to life. You know, uh, it's not just women; it's people of color, it's people of sexual orientation. So many, so many stories are hidden and um, just haven't been thought important in, in history. And I think these fictional biographies we're seeing more and more of them being written are 
are really important to tell stories we all ought to know. Um, so thank uh -huh. you so much thank for having you. me. Do you have time for a few questions? Oh, absolutely. Questions and answers? Yes. yes. Any any questions from the uh, where where were the letters that you said that there were um oh they're they're um they're in archives in England but they're published as a book I I was able to download um mm. they're they're now public domain in a lot of libraries have scanned them and so I was able to go online and you know the same with her memoirs they're all from the late 1800s I found I found a lot of wonderful sources just um, around the world in libraries. Mm -hmm. um, it, it really is, it's wonderful. One one way the internet really is terrific for a researcher. Um, that must have been thrilling. It, it was really fun. Or I would go, um, like, as I said, I became very interested in John Moore and he, the, um, the War Museum in London has a whole section on their website on him. And I, I scrolled down, I found, the pocket watch that he was carrying, you know, they have a picture, and I, I talk about it in the book. Um, I use it as a, as a prop, and I'm able to go in and see it. I could see a sword and all the. I mean, it's really wonderful mm -hmm. the stuff you can find. Um, the estate where her cousin um, Camelford took her, the family estate in Bokanuk, is is now a very chic resort you know yeah. you can if you're as rich as as <laughs> your family you can go stay there but again i could go in and look at the rooms and mm -hmm. and see wow. um um the, the the her lady hester's family estate where she grew up is now the um part of the british government it's the foreign secretary's country estate so a lot of political um uh, um, events happen there, and it's again, it's open to the public. You can, wow. you can. I, I was able again to look at the rooms and the paintings, and so you can. You, a lot of her life is there to explore if you go to um, to England, but also you can track it down in libraries, which is really fun. I had a question then, especially if if that's the case. Um, in writing in the first person, was there any any one you had to get permission from for no, her no um you you don't because i wasn't taking her word i wasn't i wasn't cribbing her words at all i that that yes you probably i would have probably thought i was just reading the letters to get a sense of her personality and her and her voice and her sense of humor it, it was just sort of to get in in, um, in character i guess you know, yeah. say if you were an actor and so but no i i really didn't i didn't try and use dialogue or mm -hmm. uh, as i said i still i i stuck very closely to her timeline like what anything i have happened in the book she was actually there at that time and and when she was at walmer and when mm -hmm. when other things happened i i tried very very hard to be accurate um, and didn't make that sort of thing up or I knew what event I even there were times when I knew what event she attended mm. um and um you know you use some artistic license like the meeting at the art studio or but but I tried to really make what was going on with her life very accurate to where she was at the time yeah when you decided I'm sorry how did you go about writing this? Did you plot it all out in the beginning and then fill in the pieces? Or? Well, the, the nice thing is I am a total cancer, we say, writing by the seat of my pants when I write <laughs> fiction. But because I did have the story arc, I knew exactly beginning, middle, blah, 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 you know, all the way to the end, which was another um, very new thing for me. It really did help right right faster i wish i could do it with my own fiction but my brain doesn't work <laughs> i sort of have to feel what the characters want to do were there other adventurous or politically active women in her family 
Um, no, her her actually her two older sisters ran away and got married very early. They couldn't they couldn't take living with the father. They were but they were not um no, they weren't as adventurous as she was. They just wanted to get out of the house, basically. Um and um and then her three her mother died when she was three, so she really had no um of course, she, her mother was apparently this wonderful, uh, charismatic. She was William Pitt, the younger sister, and he adored her. So Pitt was really the, the family figure in her. But she, she, they were very close, and he was kind of the father that she didn't have, and he never married. Um, so, no, Pitt never married. He came to the prime minister at age 24, the first mm -hmm. time. He had a very long run, then died at about 45 or something. Mm -hmm. Did you have a question or no? I, I was just excited when, in speaking about doing the book, you talked about going to first person. Mm -hmm. Did, did you start out telling the story in third person and it was on set or how or did I, you try it? I, 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 I immediately, I sort of felt from the get-go I wanted to do first person, but I did try, I did like a first chapter or something and then I tried it in third person and I thought, it's just flat, it, it just doesn't, I, I I need emotion in this book because she's she's just so full of it. She's challenging so many um, restrictions and so she's so unconventional. And you need to sort of hear it in her head. You have to you have to know her thoughts. Um, I think uh, to 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 make it powerful, um, not just some observing her, but have her be able to to be angry and rant to herself or think, you know, rail against some of the restrictions and why can't I be taken seriously? Why can't I why can't I be equal? Um, when I had a question, you said when you started you thought she had kind of an acerbic, maybe too aggressive mm -hmm. um, personality. Do you think that's true or do you think that's the way she was portrayed because she was such a pioneer i i think i think a lot of um when i everything i had read before i really started doing research on her was she was this eccentric and sharp tongue and and um aggressive you mm -hmm. know all the code words we still we today. still see <laughs> Yeah. So, you know, mm. some things don't change. Uh, okay. But yeah, and then when you sort of read her her her, her letters, she does have a, a sharp wit, but she's just fiercely intelligent too and has you know, pithy ob observations of other people and situations, but it, she was obviously um very pragmatic. I, I think she gave Good advice. I mean, Pitt trusted her judgment. There were times, I mean, I did read, she was got to the point where he allowed her to write some of the lesser letters and actually sign um, sign his name. And then you always, the, the, the secretary would initial sort of saying, I've written this for, for Pitt. And she was very proud that she was able to put her initials in some of these things. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Okay. All right. Uh -huh. oh, go ahead. After writing this book or doing all the research, how personally, how did you feel about her? I mean, did you admire her? Did you love her? I I, I really admired her. I, I think, um, you know, there were times she wanted to shake her and say, you know, try and learn how to temper your 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 judgment but that's easy to say in hindsight with, with, with things i really admire her i came to like her very much i i i, I sympathized with her i i you know cheered for her triumphs i felt um you know i can't even imagine the sorrows and the disappointments she had in practically every um person she really loved ended up um, dying before she did. And that's, you know, that happened in those days too. Death was, um, 
um, came unexpectedly at young ages for many, many people. But um, it, she she was um, remarkably strong, resilient, and courageous, and it's it's I I found her an incredibly admirable person. Okay. Um, last question. Is there anything new that you're working on? <laughs> I am I am working on my next Rexford Sloan book. And we'll see. My editor and I are tossing. I have it, it, we're deciding whether to do another one of these. And I have someone slightly in mind, but I'm not ready to reveal it. <laughs> <laughs> That's fair. <laughs> So, all right. Well, how long does it take you to um, decide? <laughs> <laughs> I have to. I well, I I just I've had other projects that I've had to get finished, so I haven't. We were. I'm sort of catching my breath and seeing um, seeing what. Um, I, I you have to keep reading. I have to I have to sort of be sure there's enough of a, a story arc um with this person. She's a very interesting and again there there would be a very good hook for her. People would recognize her family and um, and um, I, I just have to see if I if I can really see the whole the whole picture and then see see what my editor thinks too. So it's still sort of a working process. But hopefully 